Our scripture reading this morning comes from the beginning, the first three verses of Philippians 4. We are nearing the end. This is the last chapter of the letter to the Philippian church. This is a little brief section. We talked a little bit about, uh, a couple weeks ago, about these little slices of life that Paul refers to, and this is another one. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, for whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. This is a short reading of God's word. The National Geographic people have come up with a great documentary series that I've been watching. They have one on the 80s and they have one on the 90s. They're really interesting and the, the, immense, the events that they talk about and reminisce about are not only educational, but they're entertaining. I remember some of them. It's interesting to watch. Last week I was watching the documentary on the 80s and one event stood out among the others, particularly because I remember it so well. On May 25th, 1986, the great old U.S. of A. joined hands for 15 minutes in Hands Across America. Who remembers that? Mm -hmm. Ken Craig proposed the audacious idea that was called the stunt by the United Press International. He decided he wanted to raise between 50 million and 100 million for hungry and homeless Americans. He wanted to do this by enlisting six million people to perform, excuse me, perform a coast-to-coast -coast human chain across the United States on May 25th, 1986. The under undertaking was so great that it took nine months and a staff of 400 people to plan it. In spite of the road bumps, Hands Across America came off as planned at 3 p.m. on the Sunday of the Memorial Day weekend. As hundreds of radio stations across the U.S. simultaneously played Hands Across America, nearly 5 million people joined hands along this planned event route. For a fantastic 15 minutes, approximately 6 million people, give or take a dozen, stood hand to hand in support of the same cause, ending hunger in the United States. I'm not saying that the whole thing went off perfectly. One example is I tried to find a good map that had a route, and there's about four of them out there because they can't agree exactly which was the official route. And out west, there were big gaps of people where farmers brought their cattle out to stand end to end and fill in the spaces. <laughs> and, the, and the other biggest thing is that Ronald and Nancy Reagan took place on the front lawn of the White House in Hands Across America while other people, Democrats, complained that it was the Reagan administration that was the cause of homelessness and hunger in America in the first place. But for a wonderful 15 minutes, this country stopped arguing about all the negative things that plagued the 80s and were like-minded in the stand to fight hunger and homelessness. As they used to say in another one of my favorite 80s TV shows, I love it when a plan comes together. And it did, in a way. In the final chapter of Philippians, Paul is working to end the letter. Chapter 4 is the beginning of the end. I'm certain that if this was a telephone conversation, it would go on and on and on. But, but Paul was closing his letter out. And in the Bible, the heading is closing your, the appeal for steadfast in unity. We know from other, other letters that Paul is not one just to end a letter with, love Paul. That would waste valuable parchment. Paul was probably limited on writing supplies while in jail, and he noticed that he only had one side left of his daily parchment allotment. So he had to keep writing. He had to keep teaching and preaching. He couldn't just end it. And he's using his time and his parchment wisely. 
We can tell from this urgent appeal that he is making along with these instructions and assurances that he has for the church in the final words of this letter. The word therefore he used at the beginning is an indication of his final remarks, but it's also an indication for him to enforce what he said previously. It's like another way of saying so and keep going. He just told the Christians in Philippi how strongly he feels about them working together as a church. He tells them how strongly he feels about them living together as the family of God and loving everybody with the same love that they get from Jesus Christ. So he is saying, stay with Jesus. Stand up for the church and its mission. Stay strong with what you're doing. And to always stand firm in this way when the world and its evil ways tries to cause division and split up the church. Especially if the members of the church work to cause division from the inside out. These first three verses of chapter 4 are short, but they say so much regarding the purpose of his letter. Many theologians and academic types and commentary writers have written books on Philippians saying that the whole letter is about having joy. Having joy in everything. Rejoicing in God and all things. And while there's an awful lot about having joy in certain circumstances in the book of Philippians, I, I personally think these folks missed a huge point in this letter. In a couple weeks, we'll read Philippians 4.13, which is a verse that Many people love. There's about a million coffee cups, t-shirts, hats, mouse pads, whatever with it on there. And that's where a lot of these people will anchor their thinking on in joy. But throughout the whole letter that Paul writes to the Philippian church, we can learn more than just being joyful. We read more about proper church function and proper Christ representation. Paul wants the church then and now to be working hard and being hard-working servants. We just saw that we installed three servants into the leadership of deacon and elder. And if you were paying attention to the instructions and their vows that no time did I ask for them to promise to act as if they were better members of the church than anybody else. Or I didn't make them promise to order the membership of the church around because they're not members of the church council. Actually, the instructions and vows that I read that people take when they become an elder or a deacon or a pastor of, the, of a church are written with Paul's instructions in mind. And we can read them in his letter to the Philippians. And they tell us even how to follow the leadership of deacons and elders. Some of us aren't made to be deacons and elders. We're not wired that way. But Paul's instructions to the Philippian church tells us how to follow that leadership in church. Furthermore, they're meant to foster this like-minded thinking that Paul has been talking about, not only in the book of Philippians, but in all his letters. All of Paul's letters were written to encourage and teach about proper church growth and proper church strength. And the Philippians give Paul some good teachable moments. In our reading for this morning, we hear about Iodia and Syntyche. We don't know much about these women, other than the fact that they were women in the church. They had to have had some of a position in church for Paul to bring up in a leadership, but... We don't know that for sure, but what we do know is that it was causing a little bit of strife in the church by their arguing. It was enough of an issue that Paul heard about it all the way in his jail cell in Rome. And he had to write about it. He had to use valuable parchment paper to talk to Yodia and Syntyche. Paul has to plead with these two ladies to stop arguing and bickering with another. Again, whatever they were up to was, was not of the same mind of God and the church, and Paul had to nip it in the bud. He had to, he had to bring it up. It takes a church of, made up of a group of like-minded, Christ-minded, God-fearing and following people to properly succeed. 
Spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is job number one. And when we welcome people into our worship service and they form a relationship with God, that's where the joy comes from. Serving the Lord in this way is a joy like none other. And, and maybe Philippians is a little bit about joy. And then when everyone's name that comes to church and forms a relationship with Jesus Christ gets their name in the book of life, everyone gets welcomed by our Father in heaven. Let me use another one of examples of, of Paul's letters to emphasize this idea in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, Paul is talking to another church in Colossae. But he's talking to him in this passage about the same, the same way that he's talking to the Philippian church. He tells the church there that he's been praying for them continually. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you, Paul says. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have a great endurance and patience <clears throat> and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. The hidden secret to living together as like-minded Christians and like-minded believers of Jesus Christ, you want to know? Is that when we are living together as like-minded believers of Jesus Christ and strengthening the church, we are actually working on our own personal relationship with our Father. Think about that. Let me say it again. The secret to living together as like-minded believers in Jesus Christ is that when we are living together as like-minded believers in the church, we are growing in our personal one-on-one -on -one relationships with God. Thanks be to God for the love that he has for our church, for the love he has for, for picking out the servants within our membership to, to be servants in the church and for all of us as his children and the relationships that he has with us. So I was going through this. I was kind of reading it last night. We all have to be one-minded. And I came up with a list of the seven ones, the seven ones of proper Christian functioning. And if somebody else has written it before me, I'll give them credit. But this just came to me. The seven ones, one mind, one heart, one body. One Father, one Son, one Holy Spirit, and one salvation. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have put us in a church. You have found us and brought us to a church that you desire for us to serve in and to be members of and to be your family in heaven. And to be your family, your children here on earth, dear Heavenly Father. Continue to strengthen your church. Continue to strengthen the CRC of North America and, and all the churches that make up the CRC throughout the world and, and to the USA. And, and we pray for the other denominations as they seek to follow your will and your wisdom, dear Lord. Continue to grow us. Continue to strengthen us so that we may stand up and stand with you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.